Good evening. Thank you for joining me on this Wednesday night for the Wednesday night word. I am looking forward to bringing this word to you today. I don't know if any of you have watched any news or heard anything going on, uh, but as you know, especially in these last few months, we are in war. As a believer, we are in war right now. And Ephesians 6, 12 tells us this. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in heavenly realms. We are in war. Let's pray. God, we come to you tonight. God, I pray that you open our ears to hear. God, you would unstop the ears of those that are listening and open their ears to hear the word of the Lord and what he would desire to tell them. So God, open our ears to hear. God, open our eyes to see the truth and that the truth would set us free. So God, we come to you open, God focused. We set aside this time to ready to eat from the table of the Lord. God, as you feed us your word tonight, speak to our hearts. Let that, God, I pray that we not just be hearers of the words, but we would be doers of the word also. So, God, change and transform me from the inside out. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, so we know that we are fighting. It's not a flesh and blood battle that we are in. Uh, in the King James Version, it tells us that we are in a war. Not against flesh and blood, but it says against principalities, against rulers, against authorities, and against wickedness in high places. The evidence is all around us, especially in this day and age. Evil has really just come to the surface. Evil has always been there, and it's been lurking underneath, but now it has come to the surface. Um, when I think about COVID-19, and I think about the fact that, that that virus, which has caused so much fear, has brought death, ha has, has been created by the hands of man on purpose, it just blows my mind. So evil, evil has come to surface. And that, that man-made virus, COVID-19, has been weaponized to instill fear. You, you and I know, if you watch the news any, that California... Um, they're restricting churches from meeting together um, at over a certain amount. And, but they're allowing hundreds of rioters and civil unrest and all manner of evil to take place. And I don't know if you've heard recently, but um, the mayor is also trying to legalize uh, pedophilia. So we have got to come against this. And this is not by might, it's not by power, but it's by his spirit. This evil that is happening in our world, and of course we're in Texas, it's not in our state, but I'm gonna tell you evil and sin spread like cancer. So we have got to come against that. And that is not gonna be with, um, and, and we don't fight with earthly words, we fight our battles in the spirit. So we're going to use the weapons of our warfare that God has given us that we're going to be talking about in a few weeks. But right now, I just want to, to wake you up and to tell you, make sure you know, we are in a war. We're not just in a time of quarantine. It is an all-out war. Um, since March 2020, when all this COVID-19 business started in the isolation, Mental illness and depression has been on the rise and on the increase. And another evil, let's talk about another evil that's been around for a while, but that maybe I didn't speak up like I was supposed to or do anything about, and others haven't. And as a result of us not doing anything about this evil, it has, it has been compounded and it has exploded. I'm talking about the evil of abortion. Okay, worldwide. There's approximately 56 million abortions per year. 56 million. The number of abortions per day worldwide, 153,000 lives that are slaughtered. In the United States, the number in, in 2014, 
The number of abortions per year, think of these, these are lives of unborn defenseless children, 926,200. How many abortions in the United States daily? Approximately 2,538 children were eliminated, taken, killed, slaughtered, murdered. Many of them just for convenience sake. Who is having abortions? Talking about uh, religion? Who's having abortions according to religion? Listen to this. This is staggering. Women identifying themselves as Protestants obtain 43% of all abortions in the United States. Catholic women account for 27%. Jewish women only account for 1.3%. And women with no affiliation or 24, no religious affiliation or 24%. So the Protestants out, far outweigh those with no religious affiliation, 24%. And listen to this, for us who claim to be blood-bought, saved and set apart for God, 18% of all abortions are performed on women who identify themselves as born again or evangelical. 18% of us have abortions, kill our babies. And why do women have abortions? What are the reasons? 1% of, of all abortions occur because of rape or incest. 6% of all abortions occur because of the potential health problems with either the mother or the child. And listen to this, 93% of all ab abortions occur for social reasons. That meaning that the child's unwanted or inconvenient. I would say that the country we live in, the United States of America, is in a deep moral sin crisis that only God can help us out of. This is not even to mention the slaughter of human lives day after day, night after night in these big cities in the U.S., along with our police officers being killed. The sanctity and regard for human life is not here today. Where did it all start? It began back in 1973 with Roe versus Wade, when the slaughter of our unborn defenseless babies was legalized in America, and we did not regard the sanctity of their lives. So now that evil has spread, and we're not regarding the sanctity of anybody's lives. We have allowed this evil to continue and increase. And we see the results in 2020. If you didn't know it, I'm sharing with you now, our rights as born-again believers are in the balance in the United States of America. Our rights given to us by the Constitution of the United States of, of America and to have freedom of religion and the right to assemble is being fought against. We as blood-bought believers must do our part or the America we, we once knew the America we were born into, the America we've been raised in, will look very different. It will begin to look like other Marxist, communist, socialist countries where our freedoms are taken away and, and where every part of our lives are controlled by the government. We know the solution. We know the, the problem is sin. The problem in America is sin. And the only solution is, is Jesus Christ. God is the only answer to the sin-sick world that we are living in. So we need to do our part. We need to make a difference. We need to have an outcry. But the first thing we have to do is we have to take inventory of our own lives. We have to cry out like Psalms, like the psalmist did in Psalms 139, 2 through, uh, 23 through 40, 23 through 24. Psalms 139, 23 through 24. It says this, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. We must align our thoughts, deeds, and actions with the word of God. Tradition and how I've always done things cannot rule our lives 
or govern our decisions, especially if they're in direct conflict with the Word of God. If it's not in agreement, the way I was raised, my traditions, if it's not in agreement with the Word of God, we've got to forsake those things and we've got to line up with the Word of God. My feelings about things do not rule as a believer. My feelings um, about things do not rule or govern my actions. It's the Word of God that rules and governs my actions. If I want to know what to do, how to act, or how to vote, what I need to do, because we have an important election, and I'm going to tell you our freedoms are in the balance. I need to look to see what party and what person, what they stand for, and is it in accordance with the Word of God. I don't base my decisions off of fake news or propaganda. I search out the truth. And I vote for the party or the candidate that best. Neither, none of them are going to be perfect, okay? But I'm going to line up. I'm going to vote for the party or the candidate that best lines up with the Word of God. That's what I have to do. Despite how I was raised, because I was raised differently than what I'm going to vote. And the whole purpose is, is because I have to vote according to the values and my values are based on the word of God. So I have to vote for the candidates that line up uh, the best with the word of God and who are not going against the word of God. We are in a war for our country and freedoms and we better wake up and we have to do our part. And like I said, we're going to start with taking inventory of ourselves. Before we try to do anything else, we're going to take inventory of ourselves. We know we're in a war because of what we see going on. And I can tell you that many believers are struggling, struggling with their sinful desires, their flesh, struggling with sin, with fear, with depression, and with discouragement, with low self-esteem, and with brokenness. These things that I just mentioned, they keep the believer's lives bound and incapacitated and from truly living out the will of God and, and the abundant life which he died to give us. Many people often see those things that I listed as just flesh and blood problems, but I'm going to tell you, they're an assault from the enemy. But these relational problems, what happens to, to us is they weigh us down and they drain us of our energy emotionally, spiritually, and physically. The battle and the war manifest in other ways, such as an assault on our physical health, on our finances, on our children, because we know, we know who's behind it. John 10.10 10 tells us that the devil he is out to play patty cake, patty cake, baker's man with us. No, it doesn't tell us that. John 10.10 10 tells us that the devil is out to kill. He wants to steal, and he'll steal our next generation, and he wants to destroy. That's his job description. That's, that's his purpose in life. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy and take us and our children to a devil's hell that was made for him. We know the enemy... His weapons are wide range, okay? His weapons are wide ranging and they're powerful. But 2 Corinthians 10, 4 says the weapons that we fight with, they are not weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power, power from God to demolish strongholds. They are weapons that are given to us by God himself. We must know what our weapons are and how to effectively use them. Last week, we talked about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the fact that when we are baptized in the Holy Spirit, another word may be filled with the Holy Spirit. When we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we receive tongues or what is known as our prayer language. We talked about the fact that when we pray in the Spirit, when we pray in tongues, when we pray in our prayer language, that we are praying in the perfect will of God, hitting the bullseye every time. We talked about the fact that when we pray in our prayer language, it encourages us and it strengthens us. Even though our physical minds don't understand what is being said, it still, it encourages us and it strengthens us. And that is in the word of God. If you haven't, if you didn't listen to last week's, go back to last week's. 
So we should be praying, and Paul tells us in the Word of God, we should be praying daily in our prayer language. So that is a weapon. That is a weapon. But before I talk about any more weapons, we are going to be talking about ourselves. Remember, we're crying out to God for him to search us and point out any way in us that doesn't bring him honor. Um, we're going to be talking about tonight about our thought life. As Christians, our spiritual warfare is often fought on, in the battleground of our minds. Okay, it's fought in the battlefield of our mind, the battleground of our minds. And as I was studying this, I was reading over this and reading over the word in the in uh, my fire Bible, which I have, which is an awesome resource. Um, and um, I really like the study on this. I like what it had to say. So I'm going to be sharing the thoughts from my fire Bible with you tonight. So we know that our spiritual battle. This is this is the if we can get our thought life under control then the rest of our life will follow so this is the battleground the conflict involves bringing all of our thoughts and desires into line with god's character and with god's purpose if we fail to get our thoughts in line with god's character and with his purpose this will lead to ungodly thoughts and ungodly thoughts will lead to immoral desires those immoral desires left unchecked and undealt with will turn into wicked behavior. And I'm going to tell you, you can't judge your behavior by what you see today. Okay? Because this world calls evil good and good evil. But our, um, our ungodly thoughts turn into immoral desires, which turn into evil behaviors, which end in spiritual death. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 8 verses 12 and 13 say this. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. We both have sinful natures and they will urge us to do the wrong thing. But we're under no obligation to follow that. For if you live by its dictates, because it will, your sinful nature will, will try to lead you. And tell you exactly what to do. If you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit, it's not by might, not by power, but by His Spirit. But through the power of the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. James 1, 14 through 15 says, Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. Mark 7, 20 through 22. You're not going to have time to look up all the scriptures tonight, but make sure you jot them down. Mark 7, 20 through 22. It says, and then he added, it is what comes from the inside out. Okay, so it's what comes from the inside that defiles you. From within, out of a person's heart, comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. So it's saying what comes out, it's not what comes in, but what comes out is what defiles you. So we're going to talk about tonight the six steps that will help to bring our thought lives under Christ's leadership and under his authority. We're going to talk about six steps. Number one, be aware that God knows every thought and that nothing is hidden from him. God knows every thought and nothing is hidden from him. Okay, get ready to jot down these scriptures. Psalms 94, 11. The Lord knows people's thoughts, and he knows they are worthless. Psalms 139.2 You know when I sit down or stand. You know, when, you know my thoughts even when I am far away. Psalms 139.4 You know what I am going to say even before I say it. We will, you and I, will have to give an account to God for your, our thoughts as well as our words and our actions. 
Ecclesiastes 12.14. Ecclesiastes 12.14 says, God will judge us for everything we do, including every secret thing, whether good or bad. Matthew 12.35-37 says this, A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart, and an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. And I tell you this, you must give an account, listen to this, you and I must give an account on judgment day for every idle word you speak. The words you say will either acquit or condemn you. That was Matthew 12, 35 through 37. And Romans 14, 12 says this, yes, each of us will give an account to God each of us will give so we will be accountable for what we say for our thoughts what we say and what we do okay so secondly so first remember God sees it all nothing is hidden from him secondly be aware that our minds are battlegrounds be aware that your mind and my mind they're battlegrounds some of the thoughts that we think they originate from from us from our own desires imaginations and fantasies okay Other thoughts come from worldly influences or, or directly from evil forces trying to influence our thinking. Whatever the source may be, ungodly thoughts and temptations, we must resist those, we must oppose any thought, any temptation, any ungodly thought, any temptation that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. You and I do not have to be slaves to our thoughts. We do have control. We have control over what we think and what we allow to stay in our minds. And I just want to make this clear so that nobody lives under condemnation. Um, and I was just talking over this with my son the other day. It is not a sin to be tempted. Even Jesus was tempted. If you look at Matthew 4, verses 1 through 11, We'll see that Jesus was tempted and he, he did not sin. Giving in to temptation is what is sin. In fact, if you deliberately and foolishly expose yourself to images and situations that inspire ungodly thoughts and desires, you have already crossed a boundary line and set yourself up for spiritual failure. Watch, what, watch the situations you're in and what you're looking at. Number three, to take captive every thought requires doing battle against, against our sinful nature as well as Satan's spiritual forces. So you're going to fight your sinful nature. You're going to have to die daily, as Paul said. And we're fighting Satan's spiritual forces. Remember, that's why we have to have the Spirit of God. And that's another reason why we need the baptism, the overflow of the spirit it literally means that when a thought or temptation comes into our minds we are to immediately to take hold of it before it goes into our spirits we then consider how it measures up to the standards of god to the standards of purity of decency and of truth that are that are are laid out for us in the word of god this means that you and I do not dwell on the thought and let it take a hold of our minds. Instead, you take a hold of that thought and turn it over to God by submitting it to his examination and relying on his strength. The key is we're going to submit the thought to, to God for his examination and we're going to rely on his strength, not your strength, to resist that temptation. It's kind of like you and I are saying, God, here it is. Here's that thought. Take it. You already dealt with this on Calvary when you died and suffered for my sins. I need your help with this issue, and I submit my thoughts to you. Okay? Okay, so after you have submitted, number four, after you have submitted to God and you've resisted and rejected the ungodly thought, you must replace, okay? So after I've resisted the ungodly thought, I've submitted it to God, 
I have to replace the bad with the good. I, I need to replace it with thoughts and desires that honor God. Philippians 4, 8 tells this. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing, okay? Fix your thoughts on what is true, what is honorable, what is right, what is pure, what is lovely, and what is admirable. Think about these things. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. If you are wondering if you should do something, watch something, listen to something, if you will get into Philippians 4 8 and say, Is it true? Is it honorable? Is it right? Is it pure? Is it lovely? Should I be thinking it? Are these excellent things that I should be thinking of? Um, I've been discussing that. We've been, I've, I've been bringing my kids up in that way since they were little. And we've been discussing that on different levels according to their understanding all of their lives. Because they'll ask, Mom, can I watch this? And I, I don't just say yes or no. We go back to the Word because I need to teach them how to go back to the Word when they're not under my roof. So we've just been talking about the importance of what we see and what we hear and how it affects us and how it affects our minds, which will direct our lives. Okay, so these kinds of thoughts that are that are in Philippians 4, 8, the ones that are true, honorable, right, and pure, will actually guard your mind against ungodly desires and help you say no. Because <laughs> that's what we have to do. We'll have to tell Sherry no to her evil desires. We'll have to tell the enemy no. Okay? We'll say no to the devil, to temptation, and to sin. Okay? So we submit to God and we replace the bad with the good. So after we have done that, we're replacing with the bad with the good. We firmly, come on, it's going to take our effort, firmly focus our minds, our thoughts, desires, and strategies on Christ and eternal things rather than on earthly and temporal things. You'll see that in Colossians 3, 2, it tells us, think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. And that, for some of us, that's going to mean we're going to have to get into God's word and turn off the news and turn off the bad news and get into the good news, okay? Because we can be consumed with what's going on. And we need to remember that God is still on the throne. He's still in control. And this has not taken him by surprise. So sometimes we're going to have to turn off the bad news and, and tune in to the good news. Remember that the mind controlled by the Spirit, okay, a mind that is controlled by the Spirit, how do I know if my mind is controlled by the Spirit? It is characterized by life and by peace. Romans 8, 6 through 7 says this. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. So the Spirit controls my mind. It leads me to life and to peace. For the sinful nature is always always hostile to God. It will. It never did obey God's laws, and it never will obey God's laws, okay? My sinful nature, I have to crucify daily. My sinful nature will never obey God's laws. That's why i got to die daily, because when I wake up the next morning, guess what? Sherry's sinful nature wakes up with her. So we have to crucify that sinful nature every day. Fill your mind's, mind with thoughts of God and with the Word. I have encouraged many throughout the years, all the time, and you've probably heard me mention this, um, but Psalms, Psalms chapter 119 is a great psalm to read and to dwell on or just to listen to um, because it talks about, I love your word, I love your truth, I follow your statutes, I hate deceptions and I hate lies, and I'm not going to hang with those who participate in that. So I listen to that regularly and more regularly right now than ever before because there's a lot of deception out there. Um, the, the world is calling good evil and evil good, and there's just so much deception, not only in the world, but in some churches, and I don't want that to enter my mind, and it's not going to enter this church. So Psalms 119 is one of those defense, defensive and offensive uh, weapons that I use on my own mind to make sure that I remember that the Word of God is the standard, and that I will not give in to any deception of my sinful nature or the enemy. Another scripture that we need to meditate on is Psalms 1, 1 through 3. It says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord. 
and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do, prosper. Psalms 19, 7 through 14 says, The instructions of the Lord are perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The commandments of the Lord are right, bringing joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are clear, giving insight for living. Reverence for the Lord is pure, lasting forever. The laws of the Lord are true. Each, each one is fair. They are more desirable than gold, even the finest gold. They are sweeter than honey, even honey dripping from the comb. They are a warning to your servant. They warn us. A reward for those who obey him. Obey them. How can I know all the sins lurking in my heart? Cleanse me. This is, see, we can pray this as we read it. Cleanse me from these hidden faults. Keep your servant from deliberate sins. Don't let them control me. Then I will be free of guilt and innocent of great sin. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Fill your mind with those things that are noble, excellent, and praiseworthy. Philippians 4.8 says this, and now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your eyes and your thoughts on what is true. You remember we just read that. True, honorable, right, pure, lovely, and admirable. Always be careful what your eyes see and what your ears hear. Always be careful. These are the doors through which thoughts enter the mind. Refuse to let your eyes or ears be instrument for ungodly, sensual desires, moral corruption, or any argument of every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. 1 John 2, 16 says, For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from the world. Job 31, 1, I love this verse. Job 31, 1 says this, and this is what we need to do. I have made a covenant with my eyes. I have made a covenant with my eyes. I will not look with lust at a young woman. Refuse to set any worthless or evil thing in front of your eyes, whether it be movies, books, magazines, pictures, television programs, the internet, social media, or any other areas of our daily lives. Set no evil thing before you. Psalms 101.3 says, I will refuse, I will refuse to look at anything vile or vulgar. The sinners, um, Isaiah 33, verses 14 through 15 says this. The sinners in Jerusalem shake with fear. Terror seizes the godless. Who can live with this devouring fire? They cry. Who can survive this all-consuming fire? Those who are honest and fair, who refuse to profit by fraud, who stay far from bribes, who refuse to listen to those who plot murder, who shut their eyes to all enticements, to do wrong. Romans 13, 14 says, instead, clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord, Jesus Christ, and don't let yourself think about ways to indulge in your evil desires. So we are going to follow those six steps, and, and we, we need to do war. If you, don't, if you don't do battle, the enemy will take you out, because he is out to kill, steal, and destroy, and I'm going to tell you, it's high alert right now. But the first thing we need to do is take our thought life captive. So I just want to pray today. And if you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, you need to get saved. He will cleanse you from your sins. And he says, though your sins were as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. And he will give you the power. Because remember, it's not by might, not by power, but by his spirit. Through the Holy Spirit who comes to live in you, you will have power. And for you who are baptized in the Holy Spirit, you will have the power, you will have the overflow to overcome and to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ and make it line up with the word of God. So let's pray. God, we come to you today in the name of Jesus, that name that is above every name. God, I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice. God, that, that is listening, that is watching tonight. God, I just pray that, that they would hear the word of the Lord and see the urgency of the day we're in, that we are in war. But before we go and we do any kind of battle, we need to, to let you search us. Holy Spirit, search us from the top of our head to the soles of our feet. If there is any way that is vile or wicked or does not honor you, God, we pray that you cleanse us from those ways. 
And God, before I can do anything else, I need to take my, my thought life back. For us who might be letting our minds wander and have allowed things in, we need to take our thought life back. That way we can do battle and we can do it effectively. So God, right now I surrender my mind. My mind does not belong to myself. I will not follow my evil passions, tendencies, and desires. But God, I submit my mind to you. God, I will, I will not allow the enemy or this world to implant thoughts that are contrary to your word and to your standards and to your purity. So God, I will take these six steps. And I will follow your word. And God, I will have victory, God, in my life. God, I will not put vile things before me. God, that pornography that I have been watching, I will stop doing it by your power and by your strength. So God, I ask you right now, come on, for you who have been hooked into pornography and watching vile things, ask God, watching horror, right? ask God right now, God, forgive me. For feasting on things that are against your word. God, I don't have the power within myself to stop these things. But I'm not going to rely on myself. I'm going to rely on your, on your power. And so, God, I repent. I turn from that. And I go the opposite direction. And by your spirit, by your power, I will resist these things. And I will flee from temptation. And I will not fall into it. Because to, I'm, I'm praying to the God who is able to keep me from falling. So, God, I ask you to forgive me and cleanse me. You are the Savior and Lord of my life. And, God, I will stop living for my evil desires and for myself. And I will live my life to honor and glorify you. God, I do realize that this is war. And, God, I'm going to, this week, I'm going to begin with taking every thought captive. I'm not going to let those thoughts just run loose in my mind. But I, I realize that that is a battleground, and I'm going to take every thought captive. I just learned six steps to do in that. I'm going to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. God, my life is yours. Father, I plead the blood of Jesus over everybody under the sound of my voice. God, I pray that this week they would have a blessed life, a blessed life and a blessed week. God, that they would see turnaround because they are, in, uh, they are, they are not just hearers of the word, they are doers of the word, and they are taken all these thoughts captive. God, I pray to give them divine strategy, give them strength, and for us who have children, that we make sure we are training our children to do that and not allow them, especially in this time right now, to be feasting their eyes and ears on ungodly things. So God, let this be settled tonight. I am going to follow the Lord. I'm going to, um, my mind will not run away from me and be wild and wander, but I'm going to fix my thoughts on Christ, on his word. And God, I am going to be fruitful because I am going to allow the spirit to lead my life and not my own evil desires and not the world or not the enemy. So God, thank you. Thank you for your word. God, we submit the rest of this week to you and we say, have your way. God, I will follow you. And your word tells me when I follow you, I follow you into victory. God, we give you all glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll be blessed. Have a great week. And we will see you online and in church on Sunday at 10 a.m.